everybody. Uh, I am Magdalena Tiburcio. I will be working with you today. Let's get started. Um, so, Alex, this is your first webinar. Don't worry. Um, you will you will get uh, the idea soon. Um, the idea in the webinars is that you can have information that will be useful for your classrooms um, by the end of the session, an hour after the webinar finishes the platform creates automatically a certificate of attendance that will be issued to the person that got registered. If you are a group of teachers taking the webinar together, just send me an email and I'll send you back the, the certificates of attendance. I would like to apologize on behalf of Richmond because we owe many certificates of attendance from previous webinars. We had a problem with, uh, with the program we used to to create the certificates. It has been solved now, so you will be receiving any certificate that we are that we are missing. Um, the email where you can reach us is serviciosacademicosmx at richmondelt.com. Don't worry, by the end of the session, I will share all the contact emails where you can reach us. Okay. So I'm very sorry about about the things that the certificates that we haven't sent you we haven't forgotten we are not ignoring you it's just we're we're struggling with the program uh, it has been fixed okay let's get started uh, before we start talking about ideas CLIL ideas for your classroom it is very important that we define what CLIL is so um i am going to oh hello Quacalco. hi from Telesecundaria Frida Kahlo, great. We have never had a, a Telesecundaria before. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the webinar. Um, I'm going to send you a poll, okay? So in this poll, um, oh, Leticia, the chat cannot be seen for everybody. Um, I am the only person that can read what you are typing in the chat, I'm sorry, that's, that's a down part that we have with go to webinar um but i can read you right so uh let's get started with this little poll and the question is this uh what do you teach um are you teaching you should be able to see the poll right now are you seeing are you seeing the poll um please tell us what you're teaching are you teaching Preschool, are you teaching primary, junior high, young adults and adults, all of them? So what are you currently teaching? That's important for us to know. As I mentioned, um, many things that we will share today are going to be useful for everybody um, by just making a few twitches and a few adaptations, all right? so. Um, this is not a webinar only for primary or only for secondary or only for young adults. It's a webinar for everybody and hopefully you will be able to um, you will be able to apply it to your to your classrooms. That's the important part. So I think almost everybody uh, I think that almost everybody has taken the poll now, so I'm going to close it and I will share the results with you should be able to see the results now. So most of the people attending the webinar are teaching primary school. Um, some brave teachers are teaching secondary school, junior high. Um, then we have preschool teachers as well. And I think that the least people we have in the session are preschool teachers, right? So um, high preschool teachers, uh, high young adults and adult teachers. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, in this session, you will find interesting information for everybody, not just for one level. Um, CLIL is a methodology, so um, it's important that, uh, that you know that uh, as this is a methodology, there are many ways to apply it with different kinds of learners and in different kinds of contexts, right? Um, so here I have a question that says, um, uh, 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 what if you work as a supervisor? Um, okay, to you. Um, so, well, 
usually um, the most people that connect are teachers that are in front of class, but this will be useful for everybody, even if you're working with the supervisor or as a coordinator. And if you are a lucky coordinator, you don't have any classes that you have to teach yourself. Um, and in general, you work with young adults, right? Great. Okay, um, so um, there are 167 people connected. Wow, that's a record we have. Thank you so much for connecting today. Uh, let's get started with this phrase. Um, this phrase is often referred to when we're talking about Clio. Um, hi, Zacatecas. Hello, Colegio Margil. Welcome. Um, so the, the phrase says, using languages to learn and learning to use languages. So um, if you read about Clio, you will find uh, that in many books, uh, in many reference books, and articles, they refer uh, to Clio as this. So um, before we go any further, I would like to share with you another poll. And um, probably uh, the answer to this will change as we progress during the session. And the question is, what is the main focus of Clio? Is it learning the content? Is it reinforcing? Um, uh, the language learning, uh, both are equally important. What's your opinion? What do you think about Clio so far? The content is the most, the most important thing. Uh, by that, I mean, if you are teaching science in English, it means that the science is the most important thing, or is it the language the most important thing, um, or are both equally important? or mine is a question with many possible answers. What do you think? 35% of the people have voted. So I'll wait a couple more seconds for more people to vote. And then we will discuss what is the main focus of, of Clio because indeed mine is a question with many possible answers, but today we will explore some of those answers. Um, now the name of the webinar is six ideas, six Clio ideas um, for your classroom, but you will find that there are more than six ideas today, right? Um, so uh, someone is saying, I don't have a clear idea of what CLIL is. CLIL means content and language integrated learning. Now, don't worry if you don't have a clear idea about CLIL, because today we will talk about it. And hopefully by the end of this session, you will have a good idea of, of what CLIL is. Maybe you will discover that you already do it in your classroom and the idea is to give you more tools, okay? So, my voice is very slow. What do you mean? Would you like me to speak faster? This is my, my, my normal speed. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, uh, okay, I am going to close the poll now. All right, and now you should see the answers. So according to this poll, most of you think that both the learning and the content are equally important. 17% uh, of you think that the idea here is reinforcing language learning. Um, some of you think that mine is a question with many possible answers. And finally, you're thinking that content is the most important thing, right? So let's check it out, okay? Um, I do tend to speak fast when I get excited. I speak like super fast. So if I start going crazy, just ask me to hold my horses and I'll stop or I'll slow down, right? Good, so um, this is a formal definition by uh, Steve Darn. So Steve Darn says that content and language integrated learning or CLIO has become an umbrella term that describes learning another subject, for example, physics, science, geography, arts, history, or literature through the medium of a foreign language and learning a foreign language by studying a content-based subject. So it's like a double-sided um, approach you learn about content and you also learn the language. Now, how does this happen? What is more important? Is it more important that students learn about history when we are teaching them 
or is it more important for them, for them to learn about language? Um, today we will explore that. You will find that there are different levels of GLIO, right? Um, I also have this uh, definition that says that CLIL is an approach or a method which integrates the teaching of content from the curriculum with the teaching of a non-native language. So in many schools, you probably know this, you have seen it, or maybe you are teaching in a school with these characteristics. What happens is that you teach science in English, but they also teach science in Spanish. So the, the, they don't rely completely on what you're doing with science in the classroom uh, in order to, to cover the, uh, the program, for example, right? Um, and in some places they are teaching science in English, in English, and then they don't teach science in Spanish. So this is the, these both things. Um, sorry, my voice is low and is slow, Antonio. Maybe it's your internet connection. Um, so um, the CLIL, uh, as I mentioned, can be different. Okay. Um, maybe you're teaching uh, science in English or mathematics in English, and then you're not teaching it in the, in the native language of your students. Maybe you are teaching science in English, but at the same time, there is a Spanish teacher that teaches science, and that's the most important one. So today we will discuss about the different ways in which CLIL can work. Now, something you should know is that CLIL has become more and more important with the years, with the time. Um, because our, uh, our society has become global, it has become technological. Um, if you get to, uh, to for example, um, if you get to a website for, um, you know, um, the United Nations, or if you read an article about current education, uh, you will notice that um, we are called the knowledge society. So there's a lot of information and knowledge around us all the time. And more than ever, it's important that people have developed thinking skills and also that they learn to communicate. Um, English is the lingua franca of the 21st century, which means that most people can communicate through English. Right. Um, so um, back in the days, many, many years ago, maybe English was a language that you would use as a tourist. But nowadays, if you're interested in having a postgraduate degree, uh, the most uh, if you want to go abroad, for example, it's very important that you know English, not just because you want to communicate in the country wherever you go. But uh, even if you study a postgraduate level in Mexico, many of the things that you have to read are in English. So English has become a very important means of communication and it's very important that students learn how to speak it, how to understand it, but also that they learn how to learn in English. Um, and this is something that CLIL does, all right? Now, uh, CLIL is going to give you different things. It's not just that you are learning English or that you are learning the content. Uh, in When we are learning through a CLIL methodology, we are also developing thinking skills and learning skills, as I mentioned. So when we are teaching through CLIL, we are learning content. Uh, by content, I mean another subject, right? Call it whatever you want. It could be history, it could be geography, it could be art, literature, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you have the language, which in this case is English. It's very important that English is not the native language of our students. If English is a foreign language, and we're teaching content through it, we're doing CLIO. Um, we're also developing thinking skills and learning skills, and we will get into these matters a little bit deeper. So the objective in CLIO is that we introduce learners to new concepts through studying the curriculum in a non-native language. We also improve learners' production of the language of curricular subjects. So lots of people have noticed that when they are teaching other subjects in English, um, the language level in, in general increases or students become more confident or become better. Um, the, the sole reason for this is that they are in contact with the language much more, right? Also, um, it, 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 the objective in CLIL is that you have a better performance in the subjects that you are studying in English and in English as well. Um, also, as I mentioned, uh, students become more confident even in, in their native language. 
Um, we also provide materials that are going to help our students develop thinking skills. Um, nowadays, and we cannot say this enough, thinking skills are important. It's very important that we teach our students how to think. Um, we will go into this deeply and we are going to explore the topic. And I have a couple of, of practical ideas that you can, that we will experiment during the session. Also, we want to encourage stronger links with values of community and citizenship. So uh, you probably have noticed that when you are teaching subjects in English in your school, um, we also have this multicultural approach. We are usually more aware of other things happening in other cultures, not just countries, but cultures. Um, it's very common that if you are teaching English and if you are teaching subjects in English, we focus on cultures where the native language is English, but that's not necessary. You know, you can uh, talk about other cultures that probably do not speak English, but in general, um, they are learning uh, they are learning about uh, how other people think, how other people live, etc. Um, and Alex Escobar is saying that it is important to have basic vocabulary in order for students to understand the topic. That's true, and we will talk about that. A very important aspect of CLIL is that our students have a good collection of vocabulary that will uh, that will help them understand the language. Right. Um, so what is the most difficult thing about studying something in English? The answer is the vocabulary. Um, it's not the same talking about your past birthday or the holidays you had one, one year ago or your plans for the future or what you're wearing or your family, etc. It's not the same to talk about those things than to talk about science or to talk about history. You have to learn lots of technical language in order for our students to be able to understand, right? So we will talk about that a little bit later. Um, also, make the curricular subjects the main focus of classroom materials. There is something very important about CLIO, and this is, it's got many faces, right? So um, CLIO is very, very flexible. I took this from a book called Uncovering CLIO, uh, written by by Marsh, Frigles, and, and Mehisto. And um, they mentioned that CLIO is an umbrella term and it has many possibilities. So, for example, um, you probably have heard about total immersion. Total immersion is um, a, a way in which students are surrounded by English all the time. So there are some schools, especially when they are teaching pre-first, for example, where there are no Spanish classes. Everything is in English all the time. Everything in the school is in English and everybody in the school, even the person at the door speaks English, right? This is a total immersion. Also, if you go to another country, if you go to work or study abroad, you will also have a different, a, a different um, experience, right? Um, you can also have projects where you are using CLIO or maybe you have a camp where where you are use uh, where you are teaching CLIO. Um, student exchanges, right? In, in some places they have the chance to send a student abroad, maybe to another country. For example, Universidades Tecnológicas have a very nice program in many of them where some students can go to France. So in this case, students do not have to learn English as much as they have to learn French, um, but this would be a student exchange, right? Or studying abroad. And this will give you a great experience regarding language learning, right? Um, memorization, memorizing things is important in terms of vocabulary, okay? Um, Memorizing things is a cognitive skill and it's part of the thinking skills, but it's a lower order thinking skill. So what you have to be careful with is that your students are not memorizing everything. So there are things they have to memorize or there are stages where they have to memorize, but then you have to go beyond, you have to go further memorization. Right. So there's nothing wrong about memorizing things. How else are you going to, to learn the verbs in past participle? or a big collection of words. Uh, but it's important that you don't stay in that part, that you move on. 
So uh, talking about move on, let's move on and talk about the different models for Clio. So we have soft Clio and we have hard Clio. So what does this mean? I, I uh, copied this chart from uh, the TKT Clio preparation course. And in here, as you can see, it says that you have soft Clio. Soft Clio can be taught 45 minutes once a week, so it's very little, right? Not much. And in here, some curricular topics are taught during a language course. So maybe in my course book, I have um, a lesson that talks about nutrition, uh, but the entire unit is not about nutrition, right? So in this case, um, the language-led uh, approach, it's called soft Clio. In this approach, language is the most important thing. So I'm not that interested that my students learn about, uh, that my students learn about, um, um, that they learn about the topic, right? So if I have a lesson about nutrition, I am not going to apply an exam about nutrition to see that my students learn this content. If I am in a soft, clear language-led approach, my main objective is that students are practicing the language by using the content. Then we have the other extreme, which is subject-led. In subject-led, it's sometimes a 50-50 approach in, in the curriculum. Half of the curriculum is taught in Spanish, the other half in English. And in here, the most important thing is the content. So if I am teaching science in English and I am not teaching science in Spanish, then I don't care if my students make grammatical mistakes or if they are not speaking English correctly. What I want them to do is to learn science, right? So it's very important that before you get into planning, you ask yourself, what is the most important uh, thing in this activity? Is the most important thing that I that my students learn the language and practice the language or is the most important thing that they learn the content. And then you have something in the middle that it's subject-led. So in here, uh, we have some subjects or some topics in the, in the syllabus that are taught in English, right? So this, as I mentioned, um, is related to the many, um, the many um, sites or faces of Clio. Right. Um, someone is asking about the name of the book that I mentioned. I'm going back so you can see it. Uh, you can see it in the low part. Uh, it's called Uncovering Clear Content and Language Integrated Learning in Bilingual and Multi Multilingual Education. Um, this book uh, has some some good years now. <laughs> it was published in 2009. It's a very big big. Uh, it's a very good book about Clear, and Richmond has another good. A book about Clio if you're interested. Um, ask your self representative, maybe they can um, they can give you a sample of that Clio book, right? So um, let me check the questions box because I think that there are a couple more questions that were asked here. Um, okay, I don't think I understand the question, Silvia. Something about Monclova. Can you see AU in Monclova? What do you mean by AU? Um, so, 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 here we go. Um, so as I was saying, it's important that we understand which is the model of Clio that we are using. So if you are teaching your class as English, as the most important part, and sometimes you have lessons where you talk about science or where you talk about history or where you do something related to art, then you are doing soft Clio and it's language led. Um, if you are teaching maybe science in English, but the Spanish teacher is also si uh, teaching science in English, it's subject-led, which means that you are teaching the content and it is important to learn the content, but still um, it's not that one part is more important than the other. And if you are in a kind of school where half the time is in English and half the time in Spanish, you're doing um, some hard clear, right? Um, let me check again the questions box. And um, how can the teacher improve the target language if the subject in Spanish is not being developed? Um, well, this is the thing about CLIL. CLIL works very, very different than a general English class, okay? So it's important that we understand that uh, if we are teaching CLIL, we still need a language class. 
So our students have to be taught some language um, at the same time they are uh, they are learning English, right? Um, so for example, um, okay, uh, there are some questions. Bear in mind that I cannot read all of your questions uh, in real time because I'm speaking and my brain is not skillful enough to speak and read at the same time. Um, okay, hi, in Guayma, Sonora. Hi, hello. Okay, um, what English le uh, level should students have to start using CLIL in the classroom? Um, it varies a lot. Um, I have seen people with an A2 level of English using CLIL in the classroom. Um, the difference is that you would need more support, right? Um, so when you're saying, what if I teach math, reading, etc., in English, then the students go to Spanish class to study the same subject. Is it this hard CLIL? Not really. Um, it's not really that because um, um, to be hard CLIL, no one should be teaching mathematics except for you. Am I clear with that? Uh, it means that uh, if you're doing hard CLIL, students are learning mathematics in English and mathematics is only taught in English. So that's the big difference, you see? Um, it's it's very, uh, it's very different uh, to use CLIL in different levels. It's very different in different schools, um, but that doesn't mean it's not CLIL. There are many debates and discussions about CLIL because it's not an old methodology. Um, as I think that as we advance during the session, you will get clearer ideas on some of these things. Um, and I will be a little bit more practical so you can see this. Um, there are four important components in CLIL and they are called the four C's. So um, the four C's of CLIL are four elements that are included in the methodology. First of all, you have content. So content is integrating content from across the curriculum, right? So maybe reading about the, the water cycle or reading about the digestive system, or maybe you're reading about nutrition. Um, also, we have communication, which is mediating ideas, thoughts, and values through English. Um, we also have cognition, which is creativity, higher order thinking, knowledge processing. So um, when you are teaching science in Spanish, for example, the most important thing is not learning Spanish, is it? When you are teaching science in Spanish, the most important thing is that your students learn the concepts about science, that they do the experiments, that they learn this um, information related to science, right? Um, if you translate this exactly into English, that's hard clear, where the main focus is the content and the English is a tool. Some of you might be thinking, well, but what if my students are not very good at English? How can they use a hard CLIL approach? Well, the answer is you probably have to, uh, to go through a process where you give more importance to content little by little. It can't be, uh, it can be done in one day or in one school year. And something very important that you should know is that no one can do CLIL by themselves, okay? If your, school, if your school really wants to do hard CLIL, everybody in the school has to be involved. Everybody in the school has to be involved. If you want to do soft CLIL, it's something that only the English department does, or maybe you, you do it in your class. So uh, it's not that one approach is bad and the other one is good. The approaches are good as long as you adapt them to the needs that you have, right? Um, I'll stop a little to check your questions. Um, how does it work in public schools? Well, in public schools, you would never have hard CLIL, okay? Um, in public schools, you can have soft CLIL and you can have some sessions where we are learning something in English, right? I will give you practical examples in a few minutes. Um, what if you do have different levels of English in the classroom? And the question is asked by Raul Olivar. Well, this is a typical thing. Uh, even if you are not teaching CLIL, everybody has different levels of English in the classroom. 
everybody has different levels of mathematics knowledge in the classroom. Everybody has different levels of history knowledge in the classroom, right? So um, there is no way your students will know exactly the same at exactly the same level. And the answer is it's important that we include different types of practices and activities. So most of our students have a benefit. So not everybody will understand by asking, um, um, so someone is asking, is there a Richmond Language Center in Tlaxcala? Uh, Richmond doesn't have language centers because we are a publishing house, Antonio. Um, we sell books to schools, so uh, we don't have schools um, where we teach English, right? Uh, someone is saying, do you require a special degree to teach science, math, physics? Um, well, you know, the profile of a CLIL teacher is very, very difficult to find. Um, preferably, the person that teaches science in English should be a science teacher, right? That they know a lot about science. The problem is that when people specialize in science, sometimes they are not that good in English. What they do in some schools is that they find people that specialize on the content, especially in secondary school, uh, they find, for example, someone that teaches history in English, and at the same time, they have teamwork with the English teacher, right? So that, that's why I was telling you that it's impossible to do CLIL by yourself. It's something where lots of people have to be, um, have to be included, right? Um, so coming back to the four C's of CLIL, you also have cognition, uh, which are thinking skills, and you also have culture, which is basically interpreting and understanding the significance of language. So these are the four elements that you will find in CLIL and that you will find in activities related to CLIL, right? Now, there are some principles for communicative language learning that are relevant for CLIL. Um, first of all, language is a tool for communication. Um, this means that the main objective, and bear in mind that I am talking about CLIL, I am not talking about everybody's teaching practice, and this does not apply to everybody. But if language is a tool for communication, then grammar is not the most important thing, right? Um, if you are using a CLIL approach, whenever you are using the CLIL, it's important that you think about a practice that is more fluent, right? You're focusing more on the fluency and not the accuracy. What we want to do when we are using CLIL is that students learn something through English. I am very sure that everybody has done this. For example, uh, when you are doing a holiday activity, maybe a Halloween activity with your students. If you are doing a Halloween activity with your students, you're probably teaching them some words that are going to be useful to describe Halloween, right? For example, ghost, uh, witches, pumpkin, um, trick or treat. So you will teach some phrases and some vocabulary that will help them understand some things. Um, on that day, maybe you tell them a story about Halloween. Maybe you will tell them the legend of uh, the jack-o'-lantern. And um, by the end of the session, you will paint um, a beautiful poster related to Halloween. That can be a clear activity. We are focusing on, 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 you know, we're focusing on the holiday, the cultural part of it, and the language is a tool, right? Also, diversity is recognized and accepted as a part of language development, which means that not my all, not all of my students are in the same level of English, right? This is an important thing to take into account. If we are teaching um, CLIO, uh, I should be aware that there's going to be diversity. Also, learner competence is relative in terms of general style and correctness. So um, it's very, very important that whenever you are teaching CLIO, you have a clear understanding of what your objective is, okay? Um, multiple varieties of language are recognized. So sometimes it's going to be very colloquial or more uh, formal, etc. cetera. Uh, culture is instrumental. It's something that's going to help students understand. Um, there is no single methodology for language learning and teaching or set of prescribed techniques. So this means anything goes. If you're teaching CLIO, you can use several uh, tools in order for you to, to teach the language, to get through the language. Um, uh, finally, the goal is language using as well as language learning. 
right? So um, these are principles from communicative language learning that are relevant in CLIO, that are going to be useful in CLIO. And um, CLIO is going to give our students opportunities to develop their abilities, their linguistic abilities. However, don't forget that if you're teaching CLIO, it's very important that our students focus on the content, right? Now, how do we do this? It depends. So for example, uh, if I am teaching CLIO and I am focusing on language, maybe we are talking about future structures. So we are uh, learning to use future structures to make predictions. And then what I decide is to link this to technology, right? So uh, in order to practice the language that I previously taught, so previous to this lesson, I had a grammar lesson where I was teaching them this, I taught them some vocabulary, and then on the CLIL lesson, I will talk about future technology, inventions. And the objective is that my students are practicing the language that I previously taught, um, but in the CLIL lesson, I want them to learn about the content. So I would like them to learn about these new um, inventions, about these discoveries, about technology, and at the same time, practice their English. So that would be an example of a typical soft CLIL uh, approach. I am very sure that many of you use soft CLIL as a regular basis because it's very common to do this. For example, um, a typical thing that we do when we are teaching models uh, of obligation uh, or prohibition, uh, we usually talk about civics, right? Uh, about citizenship, and we talk about rules, and we talk about the importance of following rules, or maybe we learn about unusual rules around the world, etc. All of these things are clear, and the thing is that they are soft clear. Why? Because we are teaching the content as a tool and we are practicing the language that we previously taught. Now, teaching hard CLIL is very difficult because you need to participate with many other people, right? So, for example, uh, the program has to be created by a specialist on the subject, etc. So, Remember, no one can do hard CLIO by themselves. It's important that you work in teams and that everyone in the school is involved. If this is the very first time that you have read about CLIO and you are curious about it and you would like to start trying it, then try some soft CLIO that you can do by yourself in your school. Um, something important would be that you found uh, within your, your, um, your program chances where you can include content or interesting content. Um, now, the good news is that most books that there are in the market nowadays already include CLIL lessons. Most of them do. And they do this because it's usually quite important. Um, it's, it's like um, a very practical way to make language more interesting for students. Um, something important about CLIL, um, uh, you probably have heard about the TTT, right? The triple T, which is teacher talking time. Um, teacher talking time is what I'm doing right now because this is a webinar. Um, and it's basically that you are speaking a lot in the classroom. Uh, what they say is that you should have more student talking time to increase student talking time. So students have more chances to use the language, to experiment using the language, um, especially if they are learners, um, um, that are using CLIO for a long while. Um, it's normal that the very first times that you try using CLIO in your classroom, students do not participate too much or they don't know much what to say or you have to help them more, right? Because it's the very first times that you try it. But the more you try this methodology, the more your students will try to use it. Bear in mind that everything takes time. Nothing happens fast. So if you're looking for very fast results, CLIL is not the methodology that you should use. CLIL is a methodology that will give you lots of benefits, but it's steady. It has to go, it has to progress little by little, right? Now, before you try a communicative task in your classroom when you are using CLIL, make sure that the purpose and outcome is clear to your learners. So, for example, if you are going to read about the, the, water, uh, the water cycle uh, and you want your students to be able to use connectors, 
make it clear for them that the most important thing is to understand the connectors. Um, but if you want them to create a poster about the water cycle, then you should tell your students that they are going to read, extract information, and then create a poster. So every time we start an activity, the outcome should be very clear for our students. So students should be able to answer the question why I'm doing this, right? Um, I think I have a couple more questions. Um, uh, um, well, um, students, uh, Alex Escobar is saying that students do not, what happens if students do not participate, how you encourage them. Take, take into account, Alex, that sometimes students are not practicing uh, or, or are not using the language because they don't know what to say or how to say it. Um, what many teachers have tried and is quite useful is that they have fixed phrases. So if you want your students to communicate and you think that they are a little bit shy or they don't know how, you can give them the beginning of sentences and then they can personalize these sentences so they can start speaking a little. Um, scaffolding is a very important part of Quill, right? We will talk about scaffolding a little bit later. Um, uh, if I could give more ideas about how to expand student talking time. Yes, Javier, I will. Uh, as soon as I get into the practical part of the webinar, I will. Um, this theoretical part is taking a little bit longer than I expected, but it's great because you're having lots of questions and that means that you're interested in the topic. So uh, by the end of the session, I can give you some ideas where you can find more information about Clio so you can get more details. Um, but I'm very sure that when we get to the practical part, many things will look more realistic and more uh, down to earth, right? Um, also, it's very important that before our students try a communicative task, they identify the rules and the timing so that they know what are the rules for the activity and how long they have. And it's also important that we assign students roles where they are when they are wor working, right? Um, so. Um, never ask your students just to work in groups if you are giving them a, a clear task. Give them roles, right? So, for example, you are in charge of taking notes. Um, so, maybe I tell my students, work in groups of three. One person will be in charge of taking notes, the other person will be in charge of the dictionary, and the last person is going to be in charge of drawing pictures. So by giving group roles, our students are going to have a better collaboration, right? Um, Raul is making a question. How would you deal with CLIL if the topic is not that interesting for most students in the class? Well, this will always happen. You have to find ways to personalize it. And um, one of the strategies that I'm going to share with you today is related to questioning. And I think that questioning can help. When students are not very interested in the, in the topic, you can use questions to try to, to make them feel involved, right? Um, something important about Clio is that students have to develop cognitive skills as well as language skills. What do I mean by cognitive skills? Um, well, in a minute, I will show you the cognitive skills. But cognitive skills is basically the different levels at which you can think, right? We will get deeper into that one. And finally, before we get started with the six practical ideas, um, in a clear lesson, all four language skills should be combined, right? Uh, so try, it's not that it's compulsory, but it should be. Okay, so try to include something for listening, trying to include something for reading, something for writing, something for speaking, and this way your students will be able to uh, to get more information. Uh, so maybe I can give them a video, and in this video they will have a visual and an auditory input, and after the video they have a short paragraph that they have to read, and then they have to write and paraphrase what, what the paragraph said, and at the end they talk about what they, what they learned during the video. So um, it's important that we try and include most of the schools in here right? Should parents know that clearly is taught in the school? It really depends on how, how important it's going to be. For example, if you are going to eliminate science in Spanish and now you're going to teach science in English, definitely parents should know, 
that we are not teaching science in Spanish and we are teaching science only in English, they should know that. But if you are doing soft CLIO, uh, it's not that important that they know, right? Um, you can tell them if you have one of these meetings with parents and you want to tell them that one of the strategies that you use is um, teaching content in English, you can do that. I wouldn't explain what CLIO is to parents. I think it's way too abstract for them. And, and they might get more confused than, than happy that you're using it, you know? So um, it really depends on what level of intensity you're going to use. So let's get started. Let's get started with the six practical ideas about CLIO. Now that you already have a general background about CLIO, these six ideas hopefully will be clear. The very first thing that we suggest is to brainstorm before you start and when you finish a topic of study, right? Um, let's remember what CLIO is. CLIO is teaching content and language at the same time. So basically is learning things through English. For example, in this case, um, I took this from one of our books. Um, for uh, This is not a commercial, of course, but for obvious reasons, I cannot use other books than, than Richmond, right? So this comes from one of her books, and the topic in this, in this unit is, why do we tell stories about fantasy creatures, right? Um, Ariana is making a question, I'm having class, could it be possible to have a copy of this webinar? Yes, Ariana, uh, this webinar will be uploaded to, <clears throat> sorry, this will be uploaded to our channels. So uh, feel free to send me a message, uh, send me an email to serviciosacademicosmx at richmonddlt.com and I can uh, send you a copy of the link where you can see the recording, all right? Um, so uh, for example, I am going to teach this with my students. I am going to talk about fantasy creatures. So before I start talking about fantasy creatures, the best thing that I can do is to brainstorm about it, right? Here I have a little activity that comes in my book and it says which of these creatures and characters are real and then you have to complete this chart which are real and which are fantasy. So by using the chat could you tell me which of these creatures are fantasy and which ones are real? You have a giant squid, you have a mermaid, so come on let's participate. Someone is saying, oops, hold on. I clicked on the wrong button. Uh, dragon is fantasy, okay. Dragon fairy, unicorn fantasy. All right, thank you, Juana. Uh, right, the gorilla is real. The mermaid is fantasy. Okay. Guess what? The giant squid is not fantasy, it's real, right? It's scary and creepy, but they do exist not as the Kraken, but they do exist, right? Um, okay, so now your students would have a good idea about what is fantasy, what is real, etc. right? We have Dodo. The Dodo is real or it was real before it got extinct, right? Um, okay. Someone is saying that there's evidence of, of recent discoveries about Este, about, oh sorry, about the este, about mermaids, okay? Well, they say that manatees are mermaids, right? Not as pretty as Ariel, but they're mermaids, they say. Okay, great. So why are we doing this? Now, um, now you have a good collection of fantasy creatures that are here, right? A frog prince, a dragon, a fairy, a unicorn a mermaid, those are fantasy creatures. Could you give me ideas of fantasy creatures that are not here? For example, I'm going to start by saying an ogre, like Shrek, right? An elf, thank you, Carolina. Vampires, thank you, Azucena. Bigfoot, Pikachu, <laughs> that's true, Marta. Um, can you give me more ideas? A gnome, a basilisk, the jetty, the Loch Ness monster, Wolfman, the Minotaurus. Awesome, thank you very much. The Chupacabras, right? Um, if you are from Argentina, El Salvador, Uruguay or other countries, uh, you probably don't know the Chupacabras because that's very Mexican. 
right? That's also a taqueria. If you're not from Mexico City, there is a tacos place, a tacos restaurant called El Chupacabras as well, <laughs> right? El Coco, that's another fantasy creature. Okay, so uh, the idea of doing this brainstorming before we start using the topics is going to help our students understand more things. There is a theory about language acquisition called the, um, the threshold theory in Spanish is la teoría del umbral. So what this theory states is that the more vocabulary your students know, the more chances they have to understand a text, either by, by, by reading or listening. So by brainstorming before we start, we make sure that our students have a better understanding of the context and that they have more chan ch chances of understanding the text. Right? Um, Hasmin is saying el pomberito here in Argentina. What is the pomberito? Can we can we tell us, Hasmin? What is the pomberito? I have no idea. I have never heard about that. But sounds sounds interesting. Um, so while Hasmin tells us what the pomberito is, let, let's continue with. Um, with the examples. Here's another example. For example, um, example, example, right? So um, our students are going to read about nutrition. This is my book. And my students are going to learn about carbohydrates and um, and protein, et cetera, et cetera. So before my students start reading this information, I can try brainstorming what they know about nutrition, right? And maybe they will say things like calories, health, diet, and nutritional facts, food, etc. So it's important that our students brainstorm before they get into the topic. Now, this can also be done at the end, right? Um, so hold on. Here is Hasmin telling us that the pomberito, it's like a small creature who steals children who don't want to take a nap. Oh, okay, the pomberito. So we should take naps so the pomberito will not take us away, right? La Llorona, that's true. Someone is mentioning about La Llorona, it's a fantasy creature. True. Um, so I was telling you that uh, that could be do uh, that could be done at the beginning of the webinar, but uh, at the webinar, no, <laughs> sorry. That could be done at the beginning of the class, but you can also do it at the end of the class. So for example, at the beginning of the class, I'm doing this brainstorming about nutrition. Then I read about this. And then by the end of the session, I can also ask my students to do some brainstorming. Um, maybe I can draw these and they can tell me about it, right? So I show them this and they tell me what they have learned. And they were learning about oils and fats. They were learning about protein, about carbohydrates, about vegetables, fruit, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, so by brainstorming at the end of the session, it's, it's quite different. By the end of the session, our students can brainstorm ideas or words that they were learning, and then we can ask them about them. For example, someone mentioned fruit, and you can ask them, what, why did you mention fruit? Uh, fruit is a carbohydrate. It's important that we eat them because they have vitamins and minerals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You see, so by brainstorming at the beginning, you get them ready with the context so they can have more chances to understand the text. And if you brainstorm at the end, you can recap and review what they were learning and focus, of course, on the content, right? So if I'm teaching my students about this, about nutrition, by the end of the class, I, of course, would like my students to have learned some words in English related to this topic, but I also would like them to know about how to eat in a balanced way, for example. And that would be clear, right? Having content and having language at the same time. Um, so someone uh, at the lead is saying vocabulary and check what they learn. That's true, right? It's a good idea to develop vocabulary and check what they learn. That's true. Um, so also Cecilia is saying they will learn to identify the healthy plate. Uh, that's right. So this is the first idea. So the first idea was brainstorming before and afterwards, right? Um, then here's idea number two. Idea number two is questioning, but making the right kind of questions, right? Um, 
That's true, Noemi. You can also ask, what did you learn today at the end? Now, uh, it's good that you mentioned this because let's talk about questioning. Making the right question is an art and you have to practice this a lot, right? So questioning is at the heart of learning and teaching. Therefore, we need to develop our questioning skills to encourage dialogue with our learners. So um, you were asking, what can I do to involve my students more? What if they find that the content is boring and they don't want to participate? By asking some questions, we can reel them in, right? We can help uh, making them invested in the topic. Um, we also need to develop the skill of choosing the right question for the right task. And here I have some useful information. Um, this is important information uh, related to CLIL. There are different kinds of thinking. There is lower order thinking skills and there is higher order thinking skills. So the very basic level is remembering. Remember someone of you asked that if memorization was important here? Yes, it is, it's at the bottom, right? So remembering is recalling, recalling relevant knowledge from long term memory. So memorization, it is important, but it's not one of the higher order level skills, right? Um, uh, so Leticia is saying, can you show us the last slide? Which one do you mean, this one? I am, I am reading you, Leti, so you can tell me. There you go, that one, okay. Um, so don't forget that there will be a recording of the session. If there's something you didn't catch, you can check it later on. Also, if you would like to have notes from the session, feel free to send me an, an email and I'll send you back the information that you require, okay? Um, so um, about lower order and higher order thinking skills, it's important that we focus our uh, efforts, that we give more importance to higher order thinking skills because there is where learning is, okay? Uh, remembering, understanding, and applying are important. They are the beginning of the process, but you shouldn't stop there, right? So students shouldn't just remember things. Um, they have to understand them, they should be able to apply them, they should analyze them, evaluate them, and finally create. So for example, it says, remembering is recalling relevant knowledge from long-term memory. So let's continue with this information about the nutrition, right? So remembering in nutritional would be remembering vocabulary related to nutrition and remembering the different groups of um you know carbohydrates protein oils and fats etc cetera, etc cetera. then understanding would be making sense of the material you have learned so if you understand you can answer some questions right application would be that you use the knowledge in new ways so for example um you are applying this if i give you a handout where i have the plate but the plate is blank and what you have to do is to draw the, the balanced plate or the, the perfect nutritional plate that would be applying, right? Analyzing, breaking the concept into parts and understand how each part is related to one another. Analyzing would be, for example, uh, we were talking about these things in class. Now, um, look at this meal and you show them a meal maybe from McDonald's or meals from home, uh, and then they have to analyze if this is a healthy plate, right? Evaluating would be making judgments based on, 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 on a set of guidelines. And in evaluating, maybe we ask our students to design a menu where they can include things that are balanced. And finally, putting information together in an, inno in an, in an innovative way. Uh, maybe I'm asking my students to prepare a presentation where they design, um, or maybe, you know, something cool like um, a cookery show that they have to make a video where they are preparing a dish that it's the perfect balance. So this is the difference between just remembering and going through the entire process. And you will find this as, as lots and huts. Lots is lower order thinking skills, meaning remembering, understanding, and applying. And HOTS is higher order thinking skills, meaning analyzing, evaluating, and creating. 
Um, um, this is not like Bloom's taxonomy. This is Bloom's taxonomy, all right? Um, the recording of the session, by the end of the session, I will give you the links of where you can find it. Um, you can find it on Monday in YouTube, okay? Look for Richmond webinars in YouTube, and this session will be in YouTube on Monday. Um, so, hot lots and questions. This is important. When we are asking or writing closed questions, the focus is often on remembering or revisiting key content. These are lower order thinking skills. So these questions are good, but it's important that we don't stay here, that we make other kinds of questions, right? When we use open questions, we help learners to develop problem solving and higher order thinking skills. Let's see how this is done. This is, for example, a closed question that portrays lower order thinking skills. What is a food chain? And what you have to give is a definition, right? Or this one, what was the score at the end of the match? And there is just one answer, right? It's factual. The last one, are all the buildings the same? You can say yes, or you can say no. Uh, let's see how to make these questions into open questions that develop higher order thinking skills, right? Um, so it says, what would happen to a food chain if plants died? Ah, these questions make you think more, right? So if I tell you what is a food chain, oh, well, you give me a definition of what a food chain is. But if I ask what would happen to a food chain if plants die, then you have to evaluate all this knowledge you got and, and come up with an answer, right? Also, how could the result of the match have been different? This is a very different question, right? So if I ask what was the score, you can tell me this. This was the score. But if I ask how could it be, how it could have been different, then you analyze the situation and you give me your opinion and you evaluate it, etc. And the last one, are all the buildings the same? And then an open question would be, what difference would there be if the buildings were made of other materials? And that's a question that makes you think more. So it's not that um, it's not that you have to change completely the way you ask. You can actually make both questions, a, questions, a question that checks if our students remember what they were learning and a question that makes them think beyond, right? Um, here's another idea. Um, I would like you to give me examples of closed questions regarding this picture. You can send me your participations in the chat. Okay, so my question was, can you share with me closed questions uh, regarding this picture? Okay, I am opening the question box. And where is it? What city is it? Um, do we have a famous park in Mexico City? Can you see a flag on the picture? How many lakes can you see? Perfect. Great, exactly. So these are uh, simple questions that are um, lower order thinking skills. Uh, for the people outside Mexico City and outside Mexico, this is Chapultepec. Okay, this is a picture of Chapultepec. So, um, are there buildings in this picture? Which park is it? Is it a sunny day? Um, excellent. Okay, now how can I make questions that will make my students think? more. Can you think about it? Think about questions that refer to these questions to uh, to this picture too, but that would make my students think more. What I uh, have, how would you get to this place? Okay, good question. Uh, what activities can you do in there? Great. Um, what do you think about this place? Your opinion? Cool. What would happen if the trees disappeared? Great question, Blanca. Um, can you practice sports in Chapultepec? Okay, maybe you would have to research, right? Um, for the people in other countries or in other cities, what could you ask for your students to contrast this picture to what they have in their town? What would you ask? 
Someone is suggesting, how is pollution affecting green areas in Mexico City? Great question. That's a tough question. Um, here I have another one. How would you describe the weather? Okay. What would happen if we don't take care of this environment? All right. How can we clean the water there? Awesome. That's a great question, Alberto. Uh, is it different? Um, is it different from the forests in your country? All right. Um, what is the difference between city and forest? Okay. Uh, what kind of fauna and flora are there? Good question. Amazing. So as you can see, um, you can use the same thing, but ask questions in different ways, right? Um, so something important that you should take into account is if the answer is a yes, no answer, if the answer is very simple, that is not a higher order thinking skill. There's nothing wrong with doing lower order thinking skills, but you should try to do both kinds of questions, right? Um, oh, here's an amazing question that I would like to share with you. It is, what's the historical importance of Castillo de Chapultepec? Great question, um, right? Uh, someone is saying, what language do they speak in this place? Okay, I could uh, investigate, right? Um, if I don't know that this is Chapultepec, if I if I have no knowledge of Mexico, I could do that. Um, now, more ideas on the questions. You can also help your students uh, uh, making them think about their answers, right? So what do you think of that answer? Uh, what can you add to the answer? How do you know that's the answer? Is there another way we could answer this? Right, so you can ask about their answers as well. Right? Um, someone is suggesting investigate about the flag. Have you been there yet, etc. So uh, remember, um, we can ask questions that provoke thinking and also we can ask about their answers. Right? So, for example, if you uh, show, let me show you an example. Uh, I am going to ask a lower order thinking skill and then by asking about the answer I will make it higher order thinking skills right so um, I can ask my students uh, something like what activities can you do in a park like this right and then they will tell me you can have a picnic you can row a boat you can walk in the in the forest, you can take pictures, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then uh, I can ask a question, uh, uh, like for example, um, why did you choose these activities? Or number these activities from what you like the most to what you like the least, etc. So by by asking, I can make my students think in different ways, right? Um, so um, this is something important for your students. And uh, a final piece of advice for questioning is increase waiting time. Sometimes we want our students to answer quickly and by answering quickly, the quality of the answer is not that good. So make sure that you are giving in waiting time. Um, if it makes you a little bit uneasy to wait for them to answer, you can use something physical to measure time like a sandwich, for example, right? So we can slowly change the classroom culture to give clear learners more confidence to answer subject questions in a non-native language if we wait for them to answer, right? So it's important that we take some time. Um, that's true, Noemi saying that students can also ask questions about the picture. That's true, um, that's, that's a very true thing. Um, so um, the third idea is to scaffold, right? Scaffold your way to success. So scaffold means that you should take steps, taking steps to support your learners so they can understand the new content or develop new skills. Um, I think that someone cannot hear me. Um, Sometimes it's related to the internet connection. If you are in a Wi-Fi public connection, it can happen that the audio comes and goes a little bit, uh, but it's probably that. Um, can everybody hear me? Can can the other people hear me or, or, or uh, is it a general problem? 
Okay, great. Th then it's the internet connection, guys. Um, but well, if you cannot hear me, you probably cannot hear me saying that, right? <laughs> Sorry. Let me uh, let me type an answer for them. Okay. Um, because uh, um, we can't hear you. Let me reply. Check your connection. Thank you. Okay. So let's continue talking about scaffolding, okay? Because um, we are very close to the end and I would like to share all of these ideas with you. Um, scaffolding is a very important part of the process. Vygotsky wrote that what learners can do today with support, they can do alone tomorrow. So uh, some of you were asking a lot that your students are not able to do this yet. Uh, then this means that they need more support. So scaffolding is an important thing. Scaffolding can be provided for listening, speaking, reading, writing, learning about subjects, etc. And there are several things you can do. So for example, this is a way in which you can scaffold, right? Um, so to scaffold, you can consider the language that we use. You can create interest by using pictures, uh, you can break down the tasks, the tasks into small steps. If it's a very long, big activity and you think that your students are going to get lost, uh, you can break the activity into small bits so they can uh, do little by little. Also, if you give them activities to do before, during and after, remember the brainstorming thing that we mentioned, that's a way to scaffold. Um, using visuals is an amazing way to scaffold to help students. Also, demonstrating what they are supposed to do can be can be done, right? Um, also, uh, we have um, we have that using word banks, lists, vocabulary lists, glossaries. Uh, these things also help a lot. And using model text for production of language. This last part means, for example, if you want your students to write something. And you want them to give uh, you you want to give them support. You can give them a model, right? For example, if you want your students to write a paragraph um, that summarizes an idea, you can give them sample paragraphs summarizing an idea. So this helps them as support, right? Um, here I have another example. You should be able to see now a picture of a book. This book has a scaffolding strategy. Can you see it? The scaffolding strategy that we have in this book is actually uh, the vocabulary box, right? Um, so Alberto is asking, can we increase the level of questions according to the students, right? That's exactly what you can do, right? Um, Leticia, thank you very much for your participation. Leticia is saying that the scaffolding is through the pictures and the vocabulary. That's true, right? Um, so in this case, um, we have, um, we have that the vocabulary is going to help my students to understand the text that's scaffolding and the pictures as well, right? So we're talking about deserts and here's a description, but I also have a picture and that will help me understand what a desert is or grasslands, right? Um, so uh, don't forget that scaffolding is ba basically supporting our students. Sometimes it's with pictures or doing activities at the beginning, giving them vocabulary lists. The idea is that they can have steps that they can take into it. Okay. Um, uh, hold on a second because someone needs help with their audio. Sorry, it's just that um, someone's having uh, trouble uh, listening to me, okay? Um, here's the fourth idea. Uh, this is an amazing idea that I'm sure you do all the time, but this is an amazing idea for CLIL particularly, and this is to prepare poster presentations, okay? Uh, poster presentations are really cool for students um, because, um, these poster presentations are going to help your students to summarize what they learn, 
to use visuals, to use words, and they will be able to show you what they understood, right? Um, let me read this participation we have. Um, hold on a second, please, so I can check the question, uh, the participation. Um, so Guillermo is saying that having a paragraph to model what students are going to write uh, that's true, Guillermo. Guillermo is saying that having a paragraph model for students to write can also be a model for oral production. That's true, right? Um, so uh, here we have um, to prepare poster presentations. There's a variety of things you can do. Here's a little example that I found on the internet. As you can see, this little girl was reading about health and nutrition. And she created a little poster related to vitamins and why vitamins are important and where you can find them, right? She even drew a food pyramid. So um, by creating a poster, children show you what they have learned, they make it visible, and then they can use it to speak, right? They can use it to talk about it. Um, don't forget that whenever your students are doing a poster presentation, they will probably make lots of mistakes and that's okay. The important thing is that they have the confidence and that they start using the language and that they try to communicate in English. That's a very important part, right? Um, Oyuki is asking, is, necessary, is it necessary to be a poster or students can do a PowerPoint presentation? It depends on how techy you are, Oyuki. Of course, it can be a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, for example, if your students are in secondary or if they are in high school or if they are adults, they can create more sophisticated technological things, right? It could even be a video. If you want them to, uh, if you want them to try this, that would be great. Joel is asking about debates. Um, I think debates are amazing for CLIL. The only problem with debates is that they require more linguistic skills. So if your students are not there yet, if they're still struggling, uh, debates can be done, but they need lots and lots of support, right? Maybe you can give them uh, phrases that will help them with the debate. So debating is really cool. Uh, just be careful with um, how much your students can actually say, right? Um, the, uh, Javier is asking if this applies with videos. Yes, they can also create videos, right? Um, as long as they create something that shows what they are learning, it works, right? Here I have another one. In here, someone created a poster about the wider cycle where they explain what it uh, what it works, what it looks like. Now, if you have very techy students and they can make animations in the computer, they could create an animation. Right, they can create an animation that shows the water cycle. Um, also, here's another one where they are learning about fractions and they are using these plates to talk about fractions and what they represent. Right, um, so this is for mathematics, for example. Uh, they can also create a uh, Christina. Medina is suggesting that they can create brochures, PowerPoint presentations. That, yes, that's true. Right, um, Guillermo is saying, uh, is it a good idea to let the parents know that in some activities students are allowed to have errors? Yes, Guillermo, it's very important that we give parents realistic expectations. Sometimes that they think that when students are studying English in school, they will be able to, you know, uh, have a debate about uh, the advantages of being learning English in, in class and, and that's not going to happen, right? It's very important that we um, that we can um, tell our students, um, that we can tell our students' parents what to expect, that it's okay to make mistakes. Um, here we have the fifth idea, which is learning cultural aspects around international holidays always check out the calendars. In here, I have an example for the federal holidays for the United States. So you can choose one of these and talk about it when it's coming, right? So for example, next would be Columbus Day. So you can prepare a lesson on Columbus Day for students to learn about it, or they have to research about it, et cetera, et cetera, right? 
Um, you can also use holidays from your country. In this case, I found this for Mexico. So um, we also have Columbus Day, we have All Souls Days or Day of the Death, the Lady of Guadalupe Day, etc. Right. So you can choose holidays to teach about them or to ask your students to research about them. Right. Um, so if you are teaching very, very young learners, they can create a handcraft to learn about the holiday and you can tell them a story. And this way uh, they will link culture and language at the same time. Uh, right. Um, uh, yes, I'm going back to heading five, learning cultural aspects around international holidays. Right. So, for example, um, I was telling you that that Halloween is coming. We're having I don't have the date yet, but it's going to be in the afternoon. We're having a Halloween special a Halloween um, webinar where we will talk about activities that you can do with your students to promote cultural awareness. So um, something important here, again, is that you decide what to do. So, for example, uh, there are, these are some examples, right? You can teach them about the origins of Halloween or the history of why we celebrate this. Or maybe you can tell them a tale, the legend of the jack-o'-lantern, which is a little um, old legend about how we got to carve faces in pumpkins. Right, and um, you can even um, you can even do this. You can even um, you can even connect things with different cultures, right? So we could talk about what they do in Halloween in other countries, and we talk about what we do in Mexico. Which things are similar? Which things are different? Which one you like best? Which one have you experienced, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, for example, I would be very curious to know if in Argentina or El Salvador or Guatemala or Uruguay um, they do something similar, right? I would like to learn about what they do. I would like to learn their opinion about this celebration. So, there are many things that you can do related to this, right? Um, Yes, Cecilia is saying they can research about Halloween and create a little presentation about it. Yes, they can do that. You can actually mix all of the recommendations together, right? Before the Halloween activity, you can brainstorm. Uh, by the end, you brainstorm again. They can create a poster about Halloween and talk about it. There are many things you can do, right? And let's finish by talking about the last part, which is using graphic organizers. Clio and graphic organizers are best friends. So take into account that it's very important that you use graphic organizers when you are using Clio. Why? Well, because your students are getting information about many things and graphic organizers help them to put that information in order. Here I have some examples. Um, so could you tell me in the chat box which of these graphic organizers you know? Which ones have you used? Now, um, for everybody connected, I will send the invitation to the Halloween special on your email, okay? So don't worry. And I will also send to your email the link to where you can find the recording. So if you have to leave, don't worry. We're almost done. We will finish in a couple, in a couple minutes more. But I will send you to your email this information, okay? So most people know all of them. Let's go very quickly through them. We have the Carl diagram. The Carl diagram is this thing you see there. And it's to sort yes, no information according to two sets of opposite criteria. So for example, in here we have a vocabulary activity uh, related to natural and manufactured living and non-living things, right? So students are, um, they are uh, classifying. This is a Carl diagram. Uh, then we have a cycle diagram where students have to uh, show a series of events that happen again and again in the same order, right? And then you can use language to describe a cycle by using this. Um, now everything can go together because they can create a poster with a graphic organizer where they tell you about what they were learning. Someone mentioned mind maps. Here I have the mind maps too right, to show facts and their relationships about specific people, places, objects, etc. 
We also have the process or cause and effect diagram where students are showing you what happens if you follow a process. This shows cause and effect network and leads to a specific outcome. Uh, or you can show a sequence of steps that lead you to a product, right? We also have the storyboard where students write a draft um, of events in a story. And, and this could be a perfect activity for, for them to show you what they understood from a story, right? We also have the T-chart. The T-chart the T chart is going to be useful whenever you are uh, thinking about disadvantages and disadvantages, facts and opinions, for and against arguments, etc. right? Um, also, we have the table. I think everybody has seen tables everywhere because these are super useful in language, right? To categorize information or to summarize information. Um, we also have the timeline. The, time, the timeline is super useful whenever you want to show events. If you're teaching something related to science or history, a timeline is usually quite important, right, and useful. Um, a tree diagram where you are going to classify words and show their relationships with, with them, right? Um, and well, that's the information that we wanted to share today with you. Uh, these are the six ideas, uh, the six clear ideas. Um, can you remember them all? The first idea, can you remember it? The very first idea was brainstorming, right? That's right, Oyuki, thank you. Brainstorming. Then the second idea, can you remember what it was? Idea number one was brainstorming. Idea number two, what was it? Who, who would like to participate? Or what was idea number two? Got it? Right, so idea number one was brainstorming. Idea number two, questioning, right? Thank you for the participation. Idea number three, scaffolding. It's important that we do that. Idea number four, preparing poster presentations or presentations in general. Idea number five was cultural aspects uh, in your classroom, right? Awesome, thank you. And the last idea was using graphic organizers. So thank you very much for connecting today. This is my contact information. My email is mtvurcio at richmonddlt.com. Uh, you can also reach us in Servicios Académicos MX at richmonddlt.com. Um, you will find a recording of this webinar in our YouTube Richmond Webinars channel next Monday. And you can also find more information in uh, gotostage.com slash channel slash Richmond Webinars. Thank you. Thank you very much for attending. Uh, it's always a pleasure working with, uh, with teachers. Um, and uh, I think we're right on time, right? So have an amazing Friday. Thank you very much for connecting from uh, everywhere in the country and internationally. I hope you have enjoyed the session, but mainly I hope you have taken some practical ideas that you can use. So thank you for connecting. See you later. And don't forget to find the recording next week. Bye bye. Thank you.